Hello everyone, my name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. Today is day 13 of Python for DevOps series. And in this video, we will deep dive into the concept called Boto3. Some of you might have already heard about this term called Boto3. But if you haven't, don't worry. Boto3 is a Python package that is used to interact with AWS. Let's say your task is to create an EC2 instance or S3 bucket on AWS programmatically using Python. Then the module that you will use to interact with AWS APIs is Boto3. I'll make it even more simple. When we start learning Boto3 using examples, you will understand the what aspect of it, why aspect of it. And finally, we will do a real time project that is cost optimization where we will use Boto3 as well as Lambda functions in AWS, which is going to be towards the end of the video. But before we do all of these things, let's quickly recap what we have learned in the first 12 episodes of this series. So right from episode one to episode 10, we have covered all the fundamentals that are required by a DevOps engineer to learn Python. This includes very basics such as difference between shell script and Python, learning about variables in Python, how to use variables, how to write variables, good practices. Then we learned about operators. We learned about data types. We learned about functions, modules, packages. We learned about uh, lists. We learned about tuples, all the things that are required. And we also learned about the for loops. So each and everything that you want to uh, use in Python to implement projects is learned from day one to day 10. And from day 11, we started doing projects on Python. The Day 11 project is about using Python to interact with the GitHub APIs and get your work done. For example, how to get the list of pull requests by a particular user. Day 12 is about using Python to perform file operations. Day 13, that is today, is to use Python to re create resources on AWS. Tomorrow we will learn about Jira integration and so on. So you can find about the complete course syllabus in the readme file of this GitHub repository. And if you want to refer notes of any particular day, you can click on that day wise folder. And you know, uh, if you want to learn day four, probably. So what you can do is if you go to the day four folder, you have the complete notes of what are the things that we discussed and it will help you for the revision purpose. Now let's move ahead. Let's go to the whiteboard and start learning the topic for today. That is port or three. Again, I want to tell you this is a very, very simple concept. I think the most easiest thing that you can use as a DevOps engineer in Python is this Boto3 module and create resources on AWS. Of course, there is a prerequisite which I'll cover. But if I have to explain Boto3 in a nutshell, if you ask me Abhishek explain Boto3 in one line, what I'll do is I'll simply tell you if you are asked to write a Python script. And using this Python script, if you have to create resources on AWS, probably you want to create S3 bucket. There is an API for S3 bucket, right? So using Python, if you want to talk to this API and create resources in AWS and get the result back displayed to the user, the module that you will use to do all of these things in Python is Boto3. Of course, you might say, Abhishek, I can use the request module, which we did in day 11. We interacted with GitHub using request model. So the problem is that when you are talking about AWS, there is not one single API. You have hundreds of APIs and there is authentication, right? And there is a lot of abstracting that is taken care by the Boto3 module. So if using request module, if you can do it in 100 lines, using Boto3, you can do it in probably some 20, 30 lines. So that is what Boto3 does for you. And it will abstract a lot of details from you so that you don't need to learn serious Python programming. Now saying all of these things right now, you might say that Abhishek no. Yeah, I think I understood about Boto3, but one prerequisite that you have is that if you want to master Boto3, the first thing that you need to learn is how to use AWS from the UI. Let's say using Boto3, if you want to create S3 bucket or EC2 instance in AWS, 
I will tell you first you need to learn how to create EC2 instance through the UI. If you know how to create it through the UI, then you will learn some things like, okay, what are the mandatory fields? Right? Or what are all the fields that are available in EC2 instance? For example, if you don't know how to create EC2 instance through the UI, then you would not know there is something called as AMI. You would not know there is something called as instance type. You will not know that there is something called as key pair, right? So Boto3 is basically an automation. And who can be a better person in doing automation? The person who knows the manual steps, right? So if you ask me to automate something, if I don't know how to do that particular project manually, then I can never be successful in automation. This is where people find Boto3 difficult. Similarly, this is where people find Terraform also difficult, right? In our Terraform playlist, that's what I explained you. You find Terraform difficult, that means you don't have proper knowledge on AWS. You cannot create that same thing in the AWS UI also. That's the reason why you find Terraform difficult. Same with Boto3. Now comes the next part. Abhishek, there is AWS CLI. There is Terraform. There is cloud formation templates. Now we are learning something called Boto3 and all of these things, right? One, two, three, four. What all of these things do is almost the same. All of them are used to create and manage resources on AWS. Then why should I learn Boto3? This is a good question. Now what I'll do is I'll try to split this into two categories. Okay, category is AWS CLI and Boto3. Second category is cloud formation templates as well as Terraform. So these things will fall under templating languages, right? Because here you don't need to learn any programming or something, but you know, you have some template files such as the HCL templates or cloud formation templates. If you know how to write these templates, then you know, you have created the infrastructure. Whereas here, these are scripting languages. So if you want to create more than one resource or if you want to run more than one command in AWS CLI, you would use bash scripting. And if you want to do same thing using Boto3, then you will use Python scripting. So the fundamental difference between both of them is this thing is used when you want to use scripting and this thing is used when you want to use templating. Now you might ask me second question. That is Abhishek, when I can do things using templating, why should I even use the scripting part? Good question. Again, the answer to this is, you know, let's say you want to create just EC2 instance or you want to list out all the S3 buckets. This is a very simple thing. And probably if you're using AWS CLI, you will just say AWS S3 LS, which will not take even a half of a minute for you. Same thing if you want to implement in Terraform, you have to firstly install Terraform. You have to set up all the files for Terraform. You have to write the templating language. So this is not good for, you know, quick actions, right? Or immediately, if you want to get some information, then scripting or programming is easy for you. Now, okay, Abhishek, I agree with you. You said this is uh, better for scripting. Again, you have two things here, right? One is you have AWS CLI and then you have Boto3. I agree to your point. For quick actions, I'll use AWS CLI. Then why should I use Boto3? So the answer to this is you can do the same thing using Boto3 as you did here using the AWS CLI. But the fundamental advantage of Boto3 is that this is used in the serverless programming as well. That means in AWS, you know that there is something called as Lambda functions, right? Where Using Lambda functions, DevOps engineers perform some projects such as cloud cost optimization, right? Or DevOps engineers monitor resources on AWS, or you can send out some notifications upon a triggering of some alerts. To do any of these things, you will use Lambda functions, which is serverless programming. And for that, there is no option to use shell scripting. You can only use Python, Node.js, Golang, such programs. And in Python, because DevOps engineers mostly use Python, the choice that you have is Boto3. Now, I hope you understood the significance of Boto3. 
now if next time someone asks you what is the difference between cft terraform aws cli and boto3 you should be able to answer if not just try to uh, you know go back 2 minutes and try to understand what i have explained right so this is about the use case of boto3 now we discussed a lot about boto3 let's try to see it in action right so first thing that i'll do is you know i am using my github code spaces you can use visual studio code intellij doesn't matter you can use anything if you are using code spaces what you need to do is firstly you need to install aws cli in this code spaces why you need to use aws cli because one easy way to authenticate with aws is you know of course you can store the credentials and everything in your uh, python scripting as well but you know uh, the easiest way to authenticate this particular environment with aws is just download the aws cli and run the aws configure command that's it then you don't have to handle any kind of authentication or authorization so what i'll do is just come here and say dev container right we did this in terraform also if you remember right so just say dev container add dev container configuration file click on it modify active configuration and then you will see a pop up screen just say aws and you know you need to install this particular thing called aws cli in this particular environment i already have it but if you are doing it for first time you know you need to select this option and you need to install it and immediately you will see a pop up called restart right and that restart would take 10 minutes 15 minutes depending upon your internet bandwidth don't worry about that right you will see such screen perfect now i've just uh, restarted to show you how does that look like perfect so now let's start i have the aws cli so go to your terminal and authenticate this particular environment it can be your visual studio code it can be intellij or it can be github code spaces so to authenticate i'll run this command called aws configure i think we did this hundreds of times but still if you are new to aws you know aws configure is a command once you enter it will ask you for your access key and secret access key which will help you to authenticate with aws and where do you get this details from just go to your aws account click on the security credentials and under the security credentials you have this particular thing if you haven't created access keys you will see this section uh, where you can click on create access keys and you can copy access key id and secret access key then click on the next button click on secret access key provide any default region that's okay and provide any kind of output default to json is fine perfect now i have authenticated so i can start writing my boto3 scripting so i'll create a simple file called test.py and now the first thing i have to do is i will need to install boto3 right for that pip install boto3 or in your case it can be pip3 install boto3 also don't worry when you are doing pip install boto3 if you are seeing any error that means you can also try pip3 install boto3 right something like this so now pip install boto3 works for me so as i click on enter it will install the boto3 uh, module for me boto3 is also installed first thing what you'll do is you will use import statement and say import boto3 what's next right so let's say i have to create a s3 bucket so how to do that very very simple just go through the boto3 official documentation and you will notice even if you have zero experience we will be able to do it in next two minutes without help of anything so i'll just go to this boto3 documentation and you know if you just scroll down here you have uh, something let me just yeah available services click on that right and just search for s3 here so boto3 can basically interact with all of these services now i want to just use s3 so i'll just scroll down and wait for s3 here i have click on the s3 and 
you know, this is the code that they're asking to use where they are saying the first thing that you have to do is import Boto3, which I've already done. And second thing is create a client. I'll tell you what this line means. Okay, don't worry. Just wait for a couple of minutes and then I'll explain you what does uh, client mean. And then what you need to do is create an S3 bucket. So just search here, create. You have this section called create bucket. Again, if you scroll down, you will have the complete code. Just copy it from here. Paste it. Right? And these are all the fields that you have. That's why I said UI or manually creating S3 bucket is very, very important. You need to understand that before automating. So, you know, in my case, because I know how to create resources manually through the AWS. I know that I'm not bothered about all of these things. Okay, because I just want to create a dummy S3 bucket and show you all. So all of these things are not required. Of course, you can search the same thing from the Boto3 documentation also. If you just go here and if you scroll down, these are all the parameters that are available here. And you will notice a section called required. And whichever fields has the section called required, those are the fields that you have to definitely mention. So bucket is a field that is required and rest all are not required. If you are using EC2 instance, then the required flag will be for AMI and instance type, right? So in my case, bucket is the only required field. So let me create a random bucket name called Abi Demo Boto3 YouTube 123. I'm just trying to keep the S3 bucket name as unique as possible. Now, let's go ahead, clear this screen, switch to day 13 folder, and simply say Python test.py. Now, see the magic. You don't know anything about Boto3 till now. And within two minutes, now if I go to my uh, AWS console, where exactly it is. This one, search for S3 section. And you will see a bucket with the same name called Abi Boto3 Demo Bucket 123. Oh, sorry, this one. Abi Demo Boto3 YouTube 123. So this is how Boto3 helps you in abstracting most of the things here. I did not make any API call with AWS, right? I am not even bothered about any of the things. I just went to the Boto3 documentation and created. You might be thinking, okay, Abhishek, for just creating EC2 in, uh, S3 bucket, it's very easy. But for anything that you want to do, documentation is available. Let's say you want to uh, create a, or list out the objects or list the ACL of the S3 bucket, right? So let's do that. It's a little complicated, right? So let's say, how to get the ACL of this S3 bucket. So let's search for ACL. Do we find perfect access control list? These are the ACLs. And let's try to understand how we do that. Is there any code for that? Let's search for it. Bucket ACLs. Again, we need to go to the S3 section. We are already here. So here search for, go back to S3 section. And here search for ACL. Get bucket ACL. Now, if I scroll down, again, I have the code for this, right? So let's see. Here, there are two sections. One is bucket, which is required, and expected bucket owner, which you see here, is not required. So I'll just copy this code just to show you how easy Boto3 is. Replace this. And now what I'm trying to do is say response is equals to client.getbucket ACL remove this particular field and replace this string with the name of the bucket that I've just created. And now I need to see the ACL of this bucket. Let's see if I run this Python test. Oh yeah, you need to print the response, right? So let me just say print response. Perfect. See, I got the complete response ACL. Now, if you want to perform any sort of actions on this, right? You all know what is the format that returns back to you is JSON. You need to convert that into a dictionary. And 
by converting that to a dictionary you can perform any sort of actions on this data for example you want to get uh, who is the owner of particular bucket right so looking at this particular thing you can perform action i am not explaining it one more time because we already learned it in the github class where i explain you how to read this data and how to perform action right so this is how boto3 works very very simple you can take any resources most of the resources it's available now there are two things that i want to explain one is what exactly this line is so this line is a common syntax if you want to talk to ec2 just come here and replace this particular thing with ec2 if you want to replace this with i'm just giving an example i'm just making it up aks let's say eks so if you go to the particular page where you know in boto3 i went to the s3 page you will find this syntax where boto3 client s3 and all the things that you can do you will use the same syntax for s3 if you go to ec2 you will find this as ec2 and all the options that you have for ec2 will have the same code as the first line so you are basically creating a client and using this client you are talking to the aws api if this client is not there you know boto3 has the capability of talking to aws but with which aws service should it talk should it talk to s3 should it talk to uh, uh, ec2 should it talk to ebs it does not understand so that's why first you will say boto3 dot client s3 and then going to the s3 documentation page you will find what is required previously there was other option also i mean right now also it is there so you have two options one is you can create client saying client is equals to boto3 dot client of s3 and you know using this client you will talk to the s3 api similarly there is something called resource is equals to boto3 dot resource and here you will put something called s3 okay so you might be wondering for same boto3 why you have two different things right either you can create using client saying that client dot s3 bucket create or you can use using resource dot s3 bucket create for example then why you have two different things so within boto3 itself you no know, they were supporting two different options one is using client which we did and two was using resource which makes things even more easy but the problem is that i mean this was uh, something which used to be even more simple where you don't need to understand low level things this is highly abstracted thing which is much easier thing but now boto3 team said that any new services they will not support the resource package so that's why go with the client thing only that means same way that we did previously if you see any code where if they are doing something like you know boto3 dot resource of s3 don't worry that is also a valid thing where you will have slight different in the syntax but going ahead people should be using boto3 dot client only because resource is going to be get absolute they will no longer support it right and boto3 also supports something called as boto core where you know you can also handle exceptions right we learned in the exceptional handling class that there is something called as try catch uh, in python you call it as try except using that you can perform exceptional handling similarly you don't need to know exceptional handling also when you are using boto3 just like if you are using boto3 you don't need to know the request module similarly if you are using boto3 you don't even have to write that try and except part intensively where you don't need to know all the inbuilt exceptions what boto3 does is it provides something called as boto core and this module has all the kinds of exceptions which you don't have to define so inbuilt boto core has defined some exceptions which is little uh, you know advanced which we will learn in the project section right now you can ignore this one right now till here your goal is to learn how to create resources using boto3 and you can perform the same examples that we done right and you can also create some different resources now
move into the project section. So in the project section, as I explained to you, the difference between Boto3 and AWS CLI is that, right? We compared AWS CLI, we compared uh, Boto3, we compared CFT Terraform. Now, okay, Abhishek, you said some simple things where uh, DevOps engineers use Boto3 to create S3 buckets. But you said the major use case is in the serverless programming, right? Where as a DevOps engineer, I would use Lambda functions to perform some projects such as cost optimization or resource monitoring on AWS, right? Or verifying the AWS configuration, sending out some notifications. What is this Lambda functions and how to perform this particular project? We will take this project as example because this is very, very important. Cloud cost optimization is one of the major things that you would do as a DevOps engineer. So Abhishek, teach me. First thing is Lambda functions. Second thing is cost optimization. Because you know, I understood about uh, Boto3. It is very, very simple. I know how to use it. Now I want to go advanced and learn about Lambda functions and cost optimization. So both of these things we have already learned in the AWS playlist. And I will make your job much easier. What I'm going to do is instead of asking you to find this particular things in this video, you know, I'll stop this video here and I'll attach this video as well as this video. It will be a continuation only. You know, once you complete this video till here, you can just play the next parts first. From the AWS playlist, I'll attach the Lambda functions section where you will learn what exactly is Lambda functions in AWS. If you already know this, then you can skip this part and move towards the cost optimization project where you will learn how to use Boto3 plus Python plus Lambda functions to perform a DevOps engineer regular task. So this is the video for today. I hope you found it useful. Please continue watching the Lambda function and cost optimization. So I'll be attaching it after this part. This is there are multiple use cases of Lambda functions for DevOps engineers. You use Lambda functions for projects such as cloud cost optimization as a DevOps engineer. It's one of your primary responsibility. So you can use Lambda functions for cost optimization and you can trigger Lambda functions with wide range of services such as S3, CloudWatch, you can use a lot of services and perform activities which are basically called as event driven actions. Now, don't worry about all of these keywords that I'm using. I'll explain each and everything that we are talking here. And by the end of today and tomorrow's video, that means we'll take two videos for Lambda functions. And by the end of these two videos, we will master Lambda functions from the point of view of DevOps engineer. So Lambda functions has wide range of use cases. Developers also use Lambda functions with respect to serverless architecture, serverless application development. But what we will try to do is we will try to learn how DevOps engineers makes use of Lambda functions. So today's video will be focused on the fundamentals. You will understand what is the serverless architecture. You will understand the difference between EC2 and Lambda functions. When should you use EC2? When should you use Lambda functions? This is very, very important because as DevOps engineer, you have both the choices, right? You can use EC2 instances. You can use Lambda functions. So when will you use which service is cost efficient? I'll provide you all of these details in today's fundamentals. And then we will move on to try to understand. OK, we will go to the AWS dashboard. We will see what are the different features of Lambda functions. We will try to explore how to write a Lambda function on the AWS UI. And we will also expose this to outside world and very simple application. We'll execute and understand how Lambda workflow works. But in tomorrow's video, we will do practical demonstration regarding the cost optimization. That means I'll show you in real life how DevOps engineers use the combination of CloudWatch with Lambda functions and can help their organizations reduce the cost. But to understand this demo, you should definitely watch today's video because without this, 
without the foundational knowledge on aws lambda or the serverless architecture it is not possible to understand tomorrow's video so watch the video till the end and i hope you will also perform the simple demo that i am going to do at the end along with me okay so first things first first of all let's try to understand this entire concept of lambda like you know when we say lambda the first thing that you need to understand is what problem is it solving on aws so whenever we discuss about a service we always talk about the problem that service is solving right when we talk about s3 bucket right for example when i say s3 the thing that immediately comes to your mind is storage because aws is solving the storage problem with s3 similarly when lambda comes to your mind there are two things that one thing is compute and the other thing is serverless so lambda functions belong to the compute family but it solves the problem of serverless so it has two primary characteristics so it belongs to the same family that ec2 belongs to so ec2 is again one of the service that we discussed on day 3 and it was also solving the problem of compute right so previously when you were on your on premises instances right when you were working on the data centers or when applications were on the data centers so people used to create their own servers and people used to work on it when people move to aws then there is an offering from aws which is called as ec2 and what it does basically you have to provide bunch of parameters to it what kind of image you want what kind of instance type which is basically memory requirements cpu requirements and if there is any security related stuff once you provide all of these things aws will give you a ec2 instance which is nothing but a virtual compute or you can call it as a virtual server right so this is what ec2 is doing now lambda function also does something similar so lambda functions can also give you compute if you have an application let's say you have a python based application you can run this python based application on this compute that belongs to lambda but the primary difference between using ec2 and using lambda functions is that lambda functions follow the serverless architecture that means if you are spinning up a lambda function like you can go to the aws console and create a lambda function which i'll show you what would happen is that you will not provide all of these details to aws so aws will automatically take care of the server depending upon the application that you are running let's say you say that you want uh, to run a python application you want to run a node js application or you want to run uh, any kind of application then what aws does is aws will automatically create a compute for you right depending upon your requirements and once your entire application is run let's say your application is triggered you wrote an application for calculator function for example okay so when your application is running what aws does is it will create this entire compute for you and once your application is done let's say user try to perform 2 plus 3 for addition functionality of calculator once this function is done what aws does is aws will tear down the compute whereas that is not case with ec2 right so ec2 you have to take care of tearing down the instance so you can create this instance you can provide all the requirements for the instance and once your job is done you will tear down this instance whereas in the serverless architecture you are not responsible for the server at all right even in ec2 you don't manage you don't uh, create security upgrades for your ec2 instances or aws does some kind of managing right even aws take care of managing for your ec2 instances it reduces a lot of effort for you you don't have to bother a lot but when you compare with lambda functions in terms of lambda functions you don't even have to tell aws that okay i want uh, 8 cpu i want uh, 16 gb ram or you know you don't have to tell uh, aws that okay these are my requirements aws can automatically right it can automatically create a compute instance for you depending upon your application if your application requires more amount of compute than it created it will automatically scale up and once your application is done so once the task is done it will automatically scale down let me give you one basic example that we use on a day to day basis so that you will understand the concept of lambda functions so let's say there is a platform called 
food delivery platform okay so let's assume that there is a food delivery platform and it can be a mobile application or it can be a desktop application but there is a food delivery platform and this food delivery platform when a user creates a request so let's say user has created a request for uh, he wants xyz food so he goes to the check in he uh, sorry he goes to the checkout he he performs the payments and once his transaction is done then he will simply move out of the application and his food order is placed right so if you are using lambda function for this specific activity like the checkout form and uh, the payments and all the things what happens is depending when a user sends a request only then aws creates the infrastructure for running this application for running the payments application once payments is done transaction is done this user's performance or this user's job is done right now this user do not want to go to the payment application one more time so his job is to make a payment and place the order once this is done aws will tear down the infrastructure that it created for the payments application right so if you use serverless architecture this is the advantage so ec2 instance is basically pay as you use but you have to take care of using you have to take care of scaling up scaling down when you don't require ec2 instance you have to manually go there and you have to tear down the instance but here everything happens automatically that's why this architecture is called as serverless there is no server you don't have to take care of servers once the requirement is there aws will create that server for you once the requirement is done aws will tear down that server for you right so this is primary advantage of serverless but if you compare it with ec2 instance if you create an ec2 instance for example so you will get an ip address right whether it's a public ip address private ip address anything whereas in terms of lambda functions you don't get anything related to ip address or you know you will not even know where this instance is created where is it hosted okay is it uh, created with auto scaling enabled or not of course it is created with auto scaling enabled but you cannot see all of these details for the lambda function whereas if you are talking about the ec2 instance you are the complete owner of all of these details you can control uh, the public ip address uh, subnet range you can control uh, you know if auto scaling has to be enabled or disabled right and uh, you can do lot of other things that i have shown on day 3 so you should definitely watch day 3 if you want to understand more about ec2 instances right so these are the primary differences between lambda functions and ec2 which is nothing but serverless and server architecture so who will decide this who will decide that should they go with the server approach or should they go with the serverless approach so as a devops engineer you will not decide if the application that you are working on or if the project that you are working on should go with the server approach or should go with the serverless approach so this will be taken care by the development team the architecture team the design team they will decide if we want to go with the server approach or if you want to go with the serverless approach because it depends a lot on the application that is written and if that application is written in the serverless approach or not right so a food delivery platform for example a food delivery platform can run on the server architecture and it can also run on the serverless architecture so how this application is written by the developers how this application is designed by the architecture team is the one that drives the factor of going with server architecture or going with the serverless architecture as a devops engineer your responsibility is when someone tells you to create this lambda function when someone tells you to create the infrastructure then you have to take care of it or you have to use lambda function on your activities right for example like i told you you can make use of lambda functions for cost optimization right and in that case when you are doing these kind of things like cost optimization why will you not go with ec2 instance and why will you go with lambda functions only right this should be your question like abhishek you have been talking about a project called cost optimization right so you said that as devops engineers we will do something called as cost optimization where we will take a look at all the aws resources uh, that are there on the uh, platform we will see if there are any stale resources we will either delete them right or send some notifications 
for example there is a, a developer who has created a ebs volume this ebs volume was created 30 days ago and no one is using it right so as a devops engineer your responsibility is either go and delete this uh, ebs volume or send out notification saying that hey developer you have created a ebs volume 30 days ago and it is costing the organization and no one is using it right so this way you can perform and this is a very basic example so you can perform such activity on all the aws services let's say your organization is using 20 aws uh, services then you can write this code in lambda functions to control the resource usage not control the resource usage but to govern the resource usage govern is basically like monitor and report using lambda functions you can take a look at all the aws resources that your organization is using and you can report back saying that hey uh, i wrote a script as a devops engineer and what i noticed is someone has created an ec2 instance almost a year ago nobody is using it but the instance is still running with a static ip address that is instance is still running with elastic ip address and you will be costed for the elastic ip and you will be costed for the ec2 instance as well so i'd recommend you to delete it and who shared this information the script that you have written has shared this information now tell me you will run this script let's say you have written 10 python scripts for this activity okay or you have written 10 lambda functions for this activity and this activity you will run let's say every day at 10 a.m in the morning okay so you will run this script every day at 10 a.m in the morning so you would definitely prefer to use lambda functions or you would definitely prefer to use serverless architecture over the traditional ec2 instance because if you use an ec2 instance every day morning 10 a.m you have to go and create an ec2 instance if this script runs for five minutes then after five minutes you have to delete that ec2 instance right whereas if you are going with the serverless architecture what is the advantage so you just have to tell aws cloudwatch that every day at 10 am trigger this lambda function why you have to tell cloudwatch to trigger the lambda function because this lambda functions or in general the serverless uh, solution on aws using lambda function is only event driven that means it has to be driven by the event it cannot run by itself manually see i mean that's a best practice that's a better practice to trigger the lambda functions using an event so that's why what you do is every day at 10 am you can just configure a, a cron job or something in the uh, cloudwatch and tell cloudwatch to trigger the lambda function and it will perform the activity it will create the compute or it will create the server by itself it will run your 10 python scripts and once your python scripts are done AWS Lambda will automatically tear down this instance and your cost, you don't have to bother about it, right? Because it is automatically created and it is automatically tear down. Whereas in this case, you have to either write a Python script or again, you have to write a shell script or you have to write a CLI script to create an instance, tear down instance. If in some case, you know, you forget it, then you will be affected with the cost. So when required, you have to go with the serverless architecture and some of the best use cases of serverless architecture as a devops engineer is that the classic one that i just mentioned cost optimization which is primary responsibility of devops and cloud engineer right because once you move to cloud everyone wants to go and see what is their cost how did they optimize the cost did it increase or did it reduce then you can also take care of security or in other words, I can say you can also take care of compliance. How can you take care of compliance or security using the serverless or Lambda functions as a DevOps engineer is that let's say your organization has decided that nobody will create a EBS volume of type GP2. So in EBS volume, there are basically two types, which is GP2 and GP3. So if your organization says that hey nobody should use gp2 because gp2 has some security issues what if one of the developer goes ahead and creates gp2 so you can automate this behavior or you can write a lambda function say that this lambda function has to run it every day at 10 am 
to verify if there are any GP2 based EBS volumes on the AWS account. If there is any GP2 based EBS volume, you can trigger a notification. Again, you can use SNS service there. You can trigger this notification and you can send the notification to your management or the person who has created this EBS volume to immediately delete that because it's against the compliance of your organization. Or you can basically say that someone has created a S3 bucket with public access. Even these kind of things you can monitor using Lambda function. So the scope is endless. What you can do with Lambda functions is endless. So as a DevOps engineer, you have to innovate. You have to make full use of Lambda functions. Depending upon your organization, you can come up with your own solutions and you can improve cost optimization. You can improve the security of your organization. And additionally, you can also perform some things like, you know, some regular routine activities. So as a DevOps engineer, probably you want to check every day on the IAM users that are available. Okay, if someone has created uh, any additional permissions to the IAM users or IAM roles. So like I told you, the possibility of things that you can do is endless, but the primary things that every organization would look for is cost optimization and security. So you can do these things with Lambda or serverless architecture, and I will show you both the demos. So this demo, for example, if we take the security or compliance, I have already created the EBS GP2 to GP3 uh, that is already available on my channel. I'll put the link in the description. So you can uh, take a look at the link and you will understand, okay, how you will convert or you can uh, report, send out a notification using Lambda functions that someone has created GP2, please change it to GP3. The demo is already there. I'll put the link in the description, but tomorrow's video, I'll focus on the cost optimization because one demo is done. I'll focus on the demo two. And this one is very, very important. If you join as a cloud or DevOps engineer in any organization, you will definitely focus on the cost optimization part because it will be primary goals or it will be one of the most required things for organizations, right? So this is a brief introduction of Lambda functions. And now I'll quickly share my screen and show you how to use this Lambda function. It's very, very simple. The UI based thing is like you can just learn the UI in five to 10 minutes. So I'll create a very dummy sample application and we'll try to access this application. I'll show you like similar to EC2 instance, how you access the application from outside world. I'll show you that. But as a DevOps engineer, the accessing the application from outside or writing a Python uh, serverless application might not help you much because your goal is to write some scripts to automate or to provide security for your organization, but still better to go and look at the demo and understand how Lambda functions are used even in this specific case. So let me share my screen. Okay, so also if you have an interview and if you want to quickly go through the things that I've mentioned, if in interview someone asks you what is serverless or why do you use Lambda functions, you can also use this GitHub page. So I think people who are following these videos, they already know the GitHub location. If you don't know, you can uh, go through the description and I have provided the real life use cases, what is serverless, all of the things that we have discussed even on this GitHub page. So follow the GitHub repository to get updates every day. Now let's go to this uh, AWS page. So I've logged into my AWS account and all that you need to do is go ahead and search for Lambda. So you will go to this page called uh, Lambda or Lambda functions. Click on create a function. Okay, so the user interface is pretty simple. All that you need to do is do you want to write code from the scratch? So let's say you want to start writing your program directly here or do you want to use any samples that are provided by AWS? So this will help uh, developers as well as uh, DevOps engineers. So let's say you are a developer. This samples also provides you example to create a microservice that interacts with DDB table. As a DevOps engineer, you might not need this, but if you scroll down, you have some examples like uh, trigger the Lambda functions when an object is created in S3 bucket. It's a valid use case, right? Let's say you have uh, a S3 bucket and uh, you want to get notified whenever an object is created inside it, you can integrate S3 buckets with Lambda functions. Similarly, there are multiple options here. 
and the other thing is you can also write code in your personal laptop instead of writing it here you can also write code on your personal laptop and you can create an image out of the code that you have written right so you can create a docker image out of the code that you have written and you can use the image here but you have to push the image to the ecr but again these things are not that much required uh, as a devops engineer you can uh, focus on creating from scratch you can use your visual studio or something you can write it local and you can upload zip file as well in this option i'll show you in a while so let's say test let's change this to python and lambda functions can be written only in this programming languages that are available here let's say you don't know any of the programming language that is mentioned here then you cannot write lambda functions so it supports go it supports java it supports python and ruby primarily of course node.js but let's say you want to write it in shell scripting or something it's not possible so as a devops engineer you can only write in this possible options that's why i say that uh, python is also one of the useful programming languages as devops engineer click on the advanced settings and you have an option here called enable function url when you enable this one then you will get a public ip address or you will get a ip address to access the application that you have written in the lambda functions if you don't enable this you cannot access it from outside you can still run the program inside the aws environment who wants to access this people with iam access or anyone for now just say anyone can access it because you are just doing a demo and now what you will do is basically click on create function uh sorry i think yeah it's getting created just a second i think yep yeah. so it is created and if you watch it carefully so this is the function and there are two options to it right one is what is the trigger to this function and what is the destination to this function of course destination and trigger are not mandatory but a trigger is used most of the times what is a trigger i told you that lambda functions or this serverless are basically event driven functions right what does that mean this is an event driven function that means they are triggered by a specific event that event can be a cloudwatch event basically you can tell cloudwatch to trigger every day at a specific time or it can be a api event on the cloudwatch you can tell cloudwatch that okay whenever a ebs volume is created trigger the lambda function or it can be trigger from s3 s3 also has something called as event triggering so you can also trigger from s3 buckets or some other services that support triggering on aws without a trigger you have to manually run the lambda functions and that will kill the purpose of creating the serverless application as a devops engineer of course you know you can uh, create a lambda function and by yourself you can run it every day at a specific time or you can run it whenever you require but if you configure this lambda functions with some events then it will be more efficient solution right so here there is already an example of a python function uh, basically what it is doing is when you run this python function it will return hello from lambda functions on the browser right so you can just change it say that uh, hello from aws 0 to hero series right so i'm not tweaking a lot of things in tomorrow in today's video because tomorrow's video we will anyways write the lambda function for cost optimization program uh, whenever we are doing day 18 you will see that but right now i'm focusing on explaining you the structure of this lambda functions so what exactly is happening here is you can write any python code here but you have to make sure that the name of the function is lambda handler right so why you have to make sure this is lambda handler can you change it definitely you can change it but if you are not changing anything like uh, in the configuration i'll show you in a minute but let's say you are not changing the configuration this name has to be the same thing you can write multiple again like you know you can write more functions you can write function uh, definition abhishek right but this definitions will not be called automatically this definition has to be triggered from the lambda handler right so here you have to probably mention like you know abhishek and you have to invoke this function okay so the first function usually let's say you are a java developer or something you have a main function right 
So similarly, in terms of this serverless architecture of AWS, Lambda handler is the function that this serverless architecture calls, right? So if your CloudWatch is triggering the Lambda function, they, if you have 10 functions here, AWS has to know which function has to be called, right? So that first function that get calls is the Lambda handler. Now you can change this name, of course, you can go to the configurations. Uh, I'll show you in a second. You can go to the configuration and you can edit the name of the function, right? Once you edit the name of the function, you can provide uh, any name and you can modify it accordingly. But if you are not changing the name, like I'm repeating it again, if you are not changing the name here, then it has to be Lambda handler only. Okay, perfect. Now, uh, this is how you write a function, just like Python function only, but uh, there is not much difference. If you have requirements.txt, you can keep adding files here. Like if you click on the button here, you can add n number of files. You can click on new file, you can add a file, you can click on new folder and you can add folder. Let's say you are not comfortable with this uh, terminal. You don't want to write your code here. Then no problem. You can write your code anywhere and you can upload the content here. You can upload from a zip file. So what you will do as a developer, you can write your code in the uh, Visual Studio code and you can upload the zip file here. If you upload the zip file, it gets populated here and you can view this as an editor. Right now, how do you control this Lambda function? Right. So basically, let's say you want to pass some uh, arguments to this or, you know, uh, in future, you don't want to make modifications to the code. Usually what you do, if you are writing this uh, Python code on your laptop, you make use of environment variables, right? Similarly, even Lambda function supports environment variables. So you can tweak the environment variables. Uh, if you go here. Sorry. Uh, you have option for the configurations, right? Here you can provide uh, environment variables. Uh, just a second, I lost it. Yeah, sorry, it's here. So you can provide environment variables, click on the edit button and you can add the environment variables. So whenever this function gets called or on your on the compute that EC2 is creating, whenever this function gets called, you can tweak that values from the environment variables. So tomorrow you can just come here, modify the environment variable so that you don't have to touch the code again, right? So this is about uh, environment variables, how to use it. And apart from that, if you go to configuration, you will find a lot of options such as triggers. I just explained what kind of trigger you want. Then you have permissions. Who wants to access this uh, specific Lambda function? So by default, when you create a Lambda function, a role gets created for you. Okay, so AWS automatically creates a role for you. Let's say you don't want to use that role that AWS is creating. So during the creation of function, right? So let's say I'll create a new Lambda function. Click on create function. Just call it as a test one, for example. Okay, whatever it is. Uh, let me keep that. So here you have changed default execution role. You can use an existing role. Now, why this is important? Because if you have your uh, own role where you know all the permissions that are required to run the application, then yes, you can come here, click on create existing role if you have anything and you can assign that role. Again, I'm repeating whenever you are using a service in AWS, if that service has to access other services, for example, if this Lambda function has to talk to SNS, this Lambda function has to talk to uh, let's say S3 bucket for some reason for getting some information, then that role plays a critical role, right? If you are not creating a role, still it's fine. You can just use the role that uh, AWS has created for you and you can go to that role and you can increase the permissions, right? You can escalate the permissions. So it will just redirect you to the IAM console and you can redirect the permissions there as well. Just like we did in the previous videos, add permissions and attach the permissions. But the key thing to understand is you can play with it. You can increase the permissions or you can use any existing role that you have. Destinations like uh, let's say this Lambda function uh, has a destination called SNS or this Lambda function wants to uh, put some information or you know you want to send out some uh, output for your Lambda function then you can configure a destination service as well. Function URL you just saw. When I create, when I enable the HTTP access, so this is my function URL. I can make use of this URL and I can access the application. Right now, when I use this, what would happen if I click on this button? 
it will give me the output called hello from lambda. Let me increase the font. So why did it give the output called hello from lambda? Because that's the function that we have written. Let's say this is not available. I did not enable uh, the HTTP access to this uh, lambda function. Then it cannot be accessed from outside, but still any internal service can call it and lambda function can perform the required activity. This might not be that helpful for DevOps engineers because mostly we use Lambda functions for the activities that I defined. And in that activities, you don't need external activity, external access to the function. Mostly developers, if they are developing the applications in the serverless architecture, then for them, these kind of things are important. You can create this within a specific VPC, right? So if you want to create uh, this Lambda function within a specific VPC, then you can also put that so that uh, it is restricted only it can access the service within the VPC. Only the uh, services within the VPC can also access the Lambda functions. So you can also do that. Then again, there are few other options for asynchronous in invocation, concurrency, uh, database proxies. So these things are not that important from the DevOps engineer point of view. And specifically in this course that we are doing, uh, I don't think it makes sense to cover it because we are focusing on the job opportunities for DevOps engineers. So we will focus on real time use cases of DevOps engineers. We'll not focus on the edge cases, but we'll focus on the scenarios that are most widely used within a company by DevOps engineers. So stay tuned for tomorrow's project or whenever the day 18 is getting released. So this is about day 17, where I wanted to explain you about the server serverless architecture, Lambda functions, difference between EC2 instance, and just to give you a feel of how this Lambda functions would look like. And uh, you can also do this very basic demo. Just run the Lambda uh, function so that you will be ready for tomorrow's video where you will be able to perform that cloud cost optimization project. I hope you enjoy today's video and you got a lot of information from it. If you have any feedback, do let me know in the comment section. And thank you so much for watching the video till the end. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. Take care, everyone. Bye. See you in the cloud cost optimization. So this video is going to be both theory and demonstration video as part of demo. We will do a project using which I'll explain you how DevOps and cloud engineers. Basically, this is for both DevOps and cloud engineers and how they are going to use this project in a organization. So we will understand how this is used in real time, the cloud optimization project. And let me tell you that this is a very important project and most of the DevOps engineers use the cost optimization on a day to day basis. Now, why is it that? Okay, so why is that most of the organization use this in previous videos? I have told you multiple times that there are two primary reasons why organizations move towards cloud, right? The reason one why people move towards the cloud is to reduce the overhead of the infrastructure. And the second thing is to optimize their cloud cost. I mean, you can just say to optimize the infrastructure cost. What does that mean? Let's say there is a startup or let's say there is a mid scale organization for these companies. You know, the process of setting up the entire data center, then purchasing the servers, arranging those servers and maintaining an entire team. Uh, you can call them as a data center team. You can call them as system administrator team, whatever that is. So building this entire setup, uh, the data center setup, the server setup, and continuously this team has to monitor this data center, right? So if the data center is not monitored, then it will cause a lot of issues. Like there can be latency, there can be loss of data. There can be servers that are going down. So in a nutshell, that overhead for the startups or for mid scale organizations is that they have to create this entire setup by themselves and they have to manage a team. Now, this is not just an overhead, but if you watch it carefully or, you know, if you think of it carefully, setting up the entire data center, purchasing all of these servers for lifetime access, then paying out for all of these engineers. So it's going to be a big amount for the startups right or even for mid scale organizations so that's why for them a easy goal go to solution is cloud and this is something that i've explained you on the uh, first classes itself right in the first classes itself 
I've explained you what is the difference between public cloud and private cloud and why people like the startups and mid-scale organizations show interest towards the public cloud. This is something that we have discussed. So in today's video, I will explain you this second aspect that is the cost optimization aspect. Now you might be thinking that Abhishek, why uh, you or why DevOps engineers need to perform some activities related to cost optimization. I can simply move from, let's say this is a data center, the on-premises data center, right? For startups, instead of setting up this on-premises data center, I can simply onboard on cloud platforms like uh, you have the AWS because this is series is entirely about AWS. Let's talk about AWS one. So you might say that as a startup and as a DevOps engineer in the startup, I can just suggest my organization that instead of going towards the culture of building this entire data centers and everything, simply move towards a cloud platform and my job is done. You, you can say that, right? But this is a wrong thing because after moving to cloud, the cost, right? The cloud cost will go down only if you are doing this efficiently. Now, what does it mean? Why I'm saying that the cloud cost only goes if you use efficiently. Let me give you a very basic example. So let's say there is a developer. Uh, sorry, just a second. Let's say there is a developer here. Okay. You have granted this developer proper IAM access. And the IAM access is that this developer can create an EC2 instance. Okay. So now this developer has good knowledge of cloud. So he went ahead and he created his own EC2 instance on the cloud platform. And what he has done is he has attached a volume to this EC2 instance or by default, when you create an EC2 instance, there is a volume attached to it, right? Without volume, you cannot store data inside the EC2 instance. Let's say you want to create some files. You want to update some configurations and stuff like that. So this developer uh, has created the EC2 instance and he, have, he has started populating the volume and what he has done, he or she basically the volume is filled with the information that is very sensitive for the organization or, you know, they just want to take the backup of the volume. So what this person has done, he has taken backup each and every day. Okay. So taking backup volumes is nothing, but you, this person has started taking the snapshots. Okay. So in this technology terms, we call it a snapshots. If you take a uh, snapshot of a volume that means you have technically taken a backup of the volume so each and every day this person has started taking the snapshots right now after a while what has happened is you know this person said that okay uh, this feature is deprecated no i don't want this so let me delete the ec2 instance it is of no more useful and this person went ahead and let's say has deleted the volume as well Okay, has deleted the volume as well. Or for example, he was using some external volume. So like just say that this person has created additional volume for the EC2 instance and deleted the EC2 instance, but forgot to delete the volume. Now, if the volume itself is forgotten to delete, of course, the snapshots that this person has taken each and every day will also be forgotten and they'll not be deleted. And AWS will keep charging you for all these snapshots and all these volumes. So this is just one basic example. You can think of this as like there are endless uh, options, right? For example, there can be uh, S3 buckets that are created by some developer and probably that developer is not that developer stopped using the S3 buckets, but he has forgotten to delete the S3 bucket and the content in the S3 bucket, right? When you keep updating the content in the S3 bucket, eventually AWS charge will go significantly high. Right. Or let's say this person has created a EKS cluster and forgotten to delete the EKS cluster. So there are 200 resources on AWS and manually monitoring this 200 resources to verify if someone has uh, created some stale resources. Let's call this as stale resources, which is an appropriate word, right? So what is stale resources? Stale resources are something someone has created, but forgotten to uh, delete those resources. So that way the cloud cost will go high than you expected if you are not doing the cost efficiently, right? If you are not managing the cost of the cloud platform efficiently, then what would happen? The cloud cost will go high, right? Now, what is that means for an organization? So organization has moved to cloud platform, assuming their cost will go high. 
but it is sorry assuming their cost will go down but it is actually going high so this is one of the primary responsibilities of devops engineer right so devops engineer should make sure that the cloud cost should go down and how devops engineer can ensure that by looking at if there are any stale resources on the cloud platform right if there are any stale resources then a devops engineer can typically do two things one is devops engineer can send out the notifications saying that hey uh, i have noticed that you have created a, a ebs volume but it is not attached to any ec2 instance or you have created bunch of snapshots and this snapshots are not attached to any volume or any ec2 instance so why don't you delete them or if this devops engineer has access or has permissions to delete them which is uh, in general cases devops engineer would have that access so you can go ahead and also delete the instances right who can delete the instance so devops engineers can also go ahead and delete the instances so there are two possibilities and in today's video we will explore the second option because sending of the notifications using uh, sns topics is something that we have seen in the past in this series so let's focus on understanding how devops engineers can implement the cost optimization right how devops engineers can implement the cost optimization using the delete option that means by deleting the stale resources so the architecture here is very very simple i'll start with the basic architecture and i'll explain you this in a very very simple way we will use lambda functions okay uh, sorry yeah so we will be using lambda functions and inside this lambda functions we will write python code which is quite general for devops engineers devops engineers usually write the code in python uh, for the lambda functions because many devops engineers are familiar with python compared to the other options like node js or go language other options which lambda functions support so you will write python code in the lambda functions we will use a module in the python code called boto3 okay so what this will do is it will talk to the aws apis let's say you want to like you will not write one simple or one single lambda function for each and everything on the aws but you will write lambda functions individually that means you will write a lambda function for example for ebs snapshots that we were talking about okay for ebs snapshots you can write a lambda function and this python code that you have written will talk to the aws api and it will get the complete information of the ebs snapshots if there are stale snapshots or if there are active snapshots i mean if some volume is actually using the snapshots or that volume is already deleted or that volume is not attached to ec2 instance then you can delete those snapshots using the same lambda function and because lambda functions are usually event driven you can also attach this lambda function or you can trigger this lambda function using a cloud watch so now let me explain this in a very very better way so that you can also explain the interviewer i have written the notes for this as well so you can also refer to the github link in the description where i have written the project notes how to explain this to the interviewer and the code entirely is also available on github so you can follow me and you can also perform this project on your personal aws account so the architecture goes something like this firstly you have lambda function and what is the problem statement the problem statement is that there are some ebs volume snapshots okay so this developer has an ec2 instance let's say and for this ec2 instance the developer uses a volume this can be an inbuilt volume or a volume that uh, you know that comes with the ec2 instance and for this volume the developer has created multiple snapshots because he felt that the information is important later the developer has deleted the volume and deleted the ec2 instance or just deleted the ec2 instance you know and uh, the snapshots and volumes were not deleted any case case one is just the ec2 instance is deleted or case 2 is ec2 instance and volume both are related in any of the case 
these snapshots are useless, right? Because the snapshot makes sense if the uh, snapshot is available for a volume that is attached to an instance. But if not, these snapshots are available for a long time and nobody is using it. So it would be better to delete those snapshots. Perfect. So EBS volume snapshots, this is the problem statement. And what you would do is basically you would write a Lambda function. And this function is written just as, just as I mentioned, it is written in Python code. Sorry. Yeah. So it is written in uh, Python code. Uh, just a second, this stopped working. Perfect. And this will talk to the AWS API. Step one would be to fetch all the EBS snapshots. And step two would be to filter out. Okay. To filter out the snapshots that are stale. And once we identify this one, we will just delete the snapshot. Okay. So once we identify that, just proceed and delete the snapshot. And this is the exact same project that I'm going to demonstrate. And uh, don't worry if you are not aware of this uh, entire concept and if you are new to it, if you just follow the video along with me, I have the entire code that is available for you. The description is also available for you. Step by step, I'll walk you through the code and you can perform the demonstration with me. And you can add this to your resume because this is one of the day-to-day -day activities. So without wasting any time, let's quickly go to the demonstration and yeah, let me share the other screen. Okay, so now I have logged into my AWS account. You might be thinking like Abhishek, I have a question. Now, what if going back to the example that you have stated, let's say I have intentionally created some snapshots. I have deleted the volumes. I have deleted the EC2 instance, but I kept those snapshots just for backup purpose. You might be thinking in that way. Yes, that is quite possible, but you need to understand that even in such cases, what you can simply do is you can verify the timestamp. Like what is today's date and when was that snapshot created? You can give a buffer time. Let's say that for six months, if this snapshot is not used, then just delete it. So when was the snapshot last used and what is the current date? But let's not make it that complicated, right? So it is just a if condition. You can add it anytime, but in today's video, let's Try the demonstration that if the snapshot is created and if it is not attached to any volume or if it, are, it is attached to a volume, but that volume is not attached to an EC2 instance, right? In both the cases, the snapshot has to be deleted. So let's try that part. So perfect. So what I've done, like I just mentioned, uh, you can go to my github.com and you can just go to a folder called day 18. So if you go to this folder called day 18, I have added the readme document. This is exactly the problem statement and you can explain this same problem statement to the interviewer without any hesitation. If you are a fresher or if you are a college graduate, you can add this project as is in your resume as well. Or if you are an experienced person, you can add it as a point in your resume. Perfect. So now you also have the code available here. You can just uh, go to this folder called EBS stale uh, snapshots.py. So this is the code that is available as well. Don't worry, I'll walk you through the code, but just for someone who wants to uh, practice from their end first, and once they get the confidence, they want to uh, learn the code, that is also fine. You have the entire code that is available here. Now, firstly, let me implement this, and then I'll explain you the code structure, right? So that things will be clear. So I'll go here, I'll click on Lambda. Okay. And before this, what I need to do is I need to create a EBS volume snapshot. Go to the EC2 dashboard and within the EC2 dashboard. Now let's create a EC2 instance. Okay. Firstly, we'll create an EC2 instance and we will create a snapshot from the volume of the EC2 instance. 
i hope you all understood the concept of snapshot it is very very simple you can just understand it as a copy of the image so let's call it as a test ec2 instance just provide the name as ubuntu t2 micro is fine aws login is also good i don't want to change any parameters see by default there is a volume that is getting attached if you want you can add additional volume but we are fine with this volume okay so create launch instance perfect now the instance is launched and with the instance comes a volume so let's wait for the instance to be up and running meanwhile if you go to the ec2 dashboard you should be seeing a volume that is getting see there are two volumes one volume will be the volume of the instance okay so this is something that i already have on my account so let me just delete the volume perfect so this is the volume that is getting created along with the ec2 instance let's see if the instance is in running state perfect instance is in running state if you go to the instance there is this volume available here storage see this is the volume it ends with 5 uh, 45e right so we can search for that go to the ec2 dashboard and go to the volumes see this is the one 45e now what this developer has done is each and every day he started taking the snapshots of this so go back to the ec2 dashboard you have some section called snapshots create snapshot so he is just taking the copy of this volume that's it because he has some information you can just assume it as a image of the uh, volume so next if after one year if they want another volume or if they want to copy this data they can simply spin out the volume out of the snapshot okay so i have i am creating a snapshot let's call it as test snapshot create the snapshot perfect now the snapshot is also created the snapshot status is pending but it got created now what this person has done is after a while he actually want to delete the instance want to delete the volume and also want to delete the snapshot okay but this person has forgotten okay so this person forgot that the snapshot should also be deleted he has some hundreds of snapshots but he forgot to delete all the snapshots he just delete the instance automatically the volume got deleted but snapshot stayed back okay so in such case we will use this lambda function right so we are going to write now a lambda function that will help to do this activity for us so i'll keep the instance as is first we will write lambda function and i'll show you that it does not delete snapshots which are attached to volumes right that are attached to ec2 instances i mean we will see that it will not delete snapshot that belongs to a volume and that volume is assigned to ec2 instance right now we are in that state right so this ec2 instance has this volume and this volume is taken as a snapshot right so let's go to the lambda function create a lambda function called uh, cost optimization ebs snapshot let's say python we will go with the default permissions and i'll update the permissions later right so this function will fail couple of times i'll tell you the reasons so firstly let's go to our github page and copy this entire code okay i've copied the code now go back here scroll down remove this just paste the code here and what you will do after that save this click on the deploy button press control s deploy uh, click on the deploy button and then click on the test project just give the event name as test and save it because you are manually triggering the event right you are manually invoking it 
if you are invoking it through cloud watch or something you don't have to create the test event so click on the test button and now it will fail because by default lambda functions execution is only three seconds and it is also failing for some permissions issue okay it is saying that the describe snapshots permission or that role which is running this ec2 uh, lambda function does not have permissions to describe the snapshots perfect because what i'm doing i'm describing all the snapshots and i'm filtering out the stale snapshots okay uh, we will give that permissions but before that let's go to the configuration tab and edit increase the default invocation time to 10 seconds so if someone asks you what is the default invocation cost uh, time for lambda sorry not invocation default execution time for lambda is three seconds but you can increase it as your wish save it it is better to keep the execution time as small as possible because aws will charge you using this as a parameter like the lambda execution time is also one of the parameter for charging okay so make sure that you keep this time as less as possible and while doing this project let me tell you that if you don't delete this entire setup or if you don't delete the EBS snapshots or volumes that you're creating as part of this project, it will incur costs. So please delete the instances. Now, if you can go here, go to the code. Yeah. So the other thing is we have to grant permissions, right? So to grant the permissions, we need to know what is the role that is executing this Lambda function. So if you scrolled if you have followed the previous videos, you will know what is a role. Usually when one service tries to talk to the other service, that happens through an IAM role in AWS. Okay. So go to the configuration button again. And here you have um, general configuration. Where is it? Not triggers, environments, asynchronous syncs. Mm, test. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I lost the track of it. It is usually available somewhere here. No worries. Let's take a look at it. Permissions. Yeah. So this is the role, execution role. Click on it. Go to the new tab. Now add the permissions to it. Right. So what permissions are we going to add? We are going to give it describe snapshots and delete the snapshots. This is the default permission. Now click on the add permissions button. Click on attach policies. So if you just search for snapshots here, you will not find anything because that snapshot thing that we are doing, it is not part of any of these default things and it is also difficult to find. So what you can simply do is you can create policy by yourself. Okay, it is much easier to create the policy. So what I will do here is I'll come here and I'll say the role as EC2. Oh, sorry, the service as EC2. And here, let's filter the actions. Okay. What kind of actions do we want to perform? All actions on EC2? No. Or you can just say uh, here, snapshot. So here you will get all the options here, right? One is describe snapshots, describe snapshots attributes, right? Uh, writing permissions permission management permission so what exactly do you want to do so i want delete snapshot permission i want permissions to list all the snapshots so that is describe snapshots i think that should be enough describe snapshot and delete snapshot i'm not doing anything more than that let's see if there is something that we are missing i'll uh, come back and i'll update the permissions resources should be all resources right Click on the next button. Now just give the name of the policy. Cost optimization. EBS. Create policy. Did I miss something? Yes. So now the policy is created. Now what we need to do is we have to go back to that role and we have to attach that policy, right? We just created a new policy. So again, if I go back to this, click on this button. Now only let me attach the created policy to it. Add permissions, attach policy, cost, 
cost optimization EBS. This is the one, right? Add permissions. Perfect. I hope, yeah, policy was successfully attached to the role. Now let's try to execute the role. Now, what is the expected behavior? It should not delete anything because the snapshot is attached to a volume. I mean, snapshot belongs to a volume that is attached to an EC2 instance. Test it. I'm expecting, it said unauthorized calling describe instances. Perfect, because we are also describing the EC2 instances, right? We are trying to see that this snapshot belongs to a volume that belongs to EC2 instances. So we need describe instances. We also need describe volumes, right? So, I mean, I will explain you the entire code for now. Firstly, I want to show you the execution result. You will understand what is happening. Then I'll do the code walkthrough. So let's grant describe instances and describe volumes as well. If you are less patient, you can give complete EC2 instance permissions. But basically we want to do the least privilege or the least uh, zero privilege approach. So now what I can do is search for EC2 here or create policy like last time. And you can grant this EC2 full access or yeah, let's do the policy thing because people will learn from the video. Let's take couple of minutes more. Right. Again, go to EC2. Just say list. What are we trying to do? Describe volume. Describe volume. So this is describe volumes. And then we also have to describe EC2. Describe instances, right? So where is that describe instances? Yes, it's here. So this way, usually you need to grant the permissions. Click on the next button. Now if it fails again, don't worry, we will come back and we will attach. So I just want people to learn the thing. EC2 permissions. Let me just provide that, okay? Create policy. Click on create policy. The policy is created. Now go again, go back to the role. This is the one, right? And now let's attach one more permission to it. Attach policies, EC2. What was the role I just said? EC2. Just okay. Let me uh, refresh the page. Probably the information is not cached, right? So now let's try it one more time. Attach policy. EC2. Yeah. EC2 permissions. This is the one that I've created, right? Add permissions. So if you feel that the information is not reflecting, wait for a while and just refresh it. You will get that thing. Now let's perform one more time. And if it fails again, don't worry. I'm here only. Now the script got executed. Congratulations. We have increased the Lambda functions timeout and we have granted the permissions. Now the script got executed, but you will notice that the snapshot will not be deleted. Okay. I'm going to show you that. Search for EC2. See, the snapshot is still here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this instance. Okay, that instance will delete the volume as well. Terminate the instance. Okay, so the instance is shutting down. As soon as the instance will go down, the volume will also be deleted. Okay. And parallelly, what you can do is, you know, you can also create one more volume and you can also create one more snapshot out of the volume. Okay. So you can try out multiple things on this uh, uh, project, like, but let's go step by step and let me explain the code. Then it is all up to you. You can play with the project. You can create multiple instances, multiple snapshots, try out multiple scenarios by yourself. You just need to understand the concept. I hope it is done.
let's refresh and see perfect instance is deleted volume is deleted and snapshot is still there let me refresh the page and show you snapshot is still available now usually within the organizations so you can also add one more if condition here to the code what that if condition would look like instead of just directly deleting it you can verify when was this snapshot previously used or you can just send out a notification asking the team hey can you tell me uh, if i can delete the snapshot but you know let's assume that they have given you that uh, 30 days threshold they tell you that okay if the snapshot is 30 days old you can delete it or if the snapshot was lastly used 30 days ago you can delete it so we can just add that if condition it does not take much time but now let's go to our project and give the test again this time i am expecting our code to delete the snapshot as well see it said deleted the ebs snapshot as it's not associated as it's associated with a volume that was not found and that was our aim right if the snapshot is not associated to a volume if the volume itself is deleted now i will consider this snapshot as a stale snapshot and i'll delete it in your organization or when you explain to the interviewer you can also tell that we will also verify the timestamp and if the snapshot was used 30 days ago we will delete it or you can say it as is as well there is no problem so let's go back to the snapshot and see if got deleted perfect now the snapshot is deleted so this is the way how you can manage the cloud cost optimization in your aws accounts as a devops and cloud engineer now this is just one snapshot you can perform this demo like you can use the same example create 100 snapshots here and all the 100 snapshots will be deleted in one single go similarly you will write lambda functions for s3 buckets you will write lambda functions uh, for rds instances eks instances whatever you would like to in your organization right so if you want one more example let me quickly show you one more example go to ec2 dashboard go to volumes create volume don't do not create with 100 gb just create volume with 1 gb right volume is created go back to the ec2 dashboard go to the snapshots create snapshot here what is the volume id there will be only one volume you don't have to worry it because in my account uh, i just deleted everything so there is only one volume that which got just created create the snapshot perfect now i have one volume i have one snapshot and now let's see how will this project behave test it right the project got executed i create clicked on the test button now if you go to the dashboard and click on the refresh page the snapshot is zero but the volume is still there why what is the reason because i have written this in such a way that if the snapshot belongs to a volume that is not attached to any ec2 instance then delete the snapshot now this requirement might vary in your organization from organization to organization it depends right so you can add some if conditions you can add some block conditions but the fundamental principle that we have demonstrated here is if the snapshot is stale if it belongs to volume that is not attached to any ec2 instance just go ahead and delete it it's up to your requirement now let me explain you the code because i have given you the walk through of the demonstration final part that is left is i'll explain you the code so what i have done here is i am using the python code and i'm using a module called boto3 boto3 documentation is very very good all that you need to do is you can just write steps of what you want to perform write it in plain english on a note paper or on a notepad then just go to the boto3 documentation okay search for boto3 and these days you can make uh, use of the chat gpt and other things as well for such programs now what i am going to do here is i will search step by step first thing what i want to do right so in this entire thing the examples that i have performed what i want to do is i want to list all the snapshots i want to list all the volumes i want to list all the ec2 instance right and once i list all of these things now my thing would be to verify if this snapshot 
belongs to a volume and if that volume is attached to any existing EC2 instance or not or running state EC2 instance or not. So firstly, what I've done here is I got the code for all the running EC2 instances. Okay, so how did I do that? I just went to the Boto3 documentation, just search for Boto3 EC2. So you'll go to the Boto3 EC2 documentation. Here you can search for different options for EC2 and you'll get the code ready. For example, I wanted to describe the EC2 instances, right? So I'll just search describe instances, go there and here you have the syntax, right? This syntax will not be 100% correct. I mean, you have to modify it according to your examples. So what I've done is I've taken this syntax and I have put that in the program. Okay. And these days, like I told you, you can take help of chat GPT as well. But I just said EC2, like I created the Boto3 client. This is the Boto3 module that I've imported if you know Python. And inside this, I created a client for EC2 and using that client, which will talk to the AWS EC2 API. I am getting all the EC2 snapshots. Oh, sorry. Uh, this was the one. Uh, ignore this statement for now. So using this EC2, what I did is EC2 dot describe instances. That means I am getting all the instances that are in running state. Perfect. Now, once I have this, once I have the instances or EC2 instance information, now I am just getting the instance ID, right? What did I get here? I just got the entire JSON of the EC2. If you go here, you will also find that information. When you search for the Boto3 module, they have the request syntax and they also have the response as well. So what are you going to get as a response when you execute that? You are getting this entire information of all the EC2 instances. But I just want the EC2 instance ID. So there you need to understand how to parse the JSONs. So you need little Python knowledge here because this is not a Python class. I'm not going to deep dive into it. But here what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a for loop on all the EC2 instances JSON and I'm just going to get the instance ID. So this active instance ID is a set data type that I've created and I'm storing this in the active instance ID set. Similarly, I got all the snapshots information and I've got the volumes information. Okay, once I have that, this is the exact logic that I have described. Okay, so what I'm doing, once I have the snapshot information, I'm verifying if that snapshot has a volume ID or not in the JSON format of the snapshot. Then if it does not have any volume ID, then I'm deleting the snapshot. Let's say if it has a volume ID that is attached to it, or if it belongs to a volume, then I'm verifying if the volume still exists or not. Right? If someone has deleted the volume or if it is available. If the volume does not exist still, then using the try catch condition or use in Python, we say try accept. Using the try accept, I'm handling the situation and I'm deleting the snapshots again. Right? Both the cases I'm handling here. Volume is deleted or volume is present and it is not attached to the EC2 instance. Now in your organization, if the request is slightly different, if the requirement is slightly different because there is no standard procedure for every organization. In some organization, they keep the snapshots like that. Okay. They just take the snapshots and they put that in the S3 glacier. Okay. So if the snapshots are available, 100 snapshots, 1000 snapshots, instead of just deleting them, they'll create a S3 bucket and inside the S3 glacier, which is a uh, glacier deep archive, which is a cheap uh, S3 life cycle. They'll just go there and store the snapshots. Some organization would delete the snapshots, right? It depends upon the organization to organization. We took one scenario and I've explained you the entire thing, right? So this is how you use the AWS Lambda functions. But one thing that is left is I told you in the last class that Lambda functions are even driven in nature. But here I was running this Lambda functions manually. So it's again up to you if you want to run the manually then you can create a test event and run it or else, you know, we have our friend, which is CloudWatch. So you can go to CloudWatch and you can invoke this using CloudWatch. You can just tell that invoke it once every day, or you can say that invoke it once a week. You can say whatever you would like to, 
right so you can go to the cloud watch and here uh, you have events in the events you can just say rules and you can configure the lambda function as an event or you can run it manually so it's up to you so last time i have uh, invoked a ebs volume check which we have done in our channel only so what you will do i haven't deleted it uh, it is available from last time but simple it is just create a rule what is the name of the rule that you want uh, let's say ebs snapshots rule provide any description and instead of running with an event pattern you can run it on a specific schedule right continue with the event event bridge scheduler that means this cloudwatch is creating an event bridge between cloudwatch and lambda function so here you can say when exactly do you want to schedule right so use the default scheduling group is it one time schedule or recurring schedule so here you can provide a cron which minute like let's say it has to be provided in this way let's say you want to run it on 6:30 pm every day sorry 6:30 am every day uh, you can just say day of the month uh, probably you can say every monday or every wednesday or every tuesday right or you want to run it on 10th of every month uh, which month do you want to run day of the week i i'll explain you what i'm uh, building the cron here and uh, let's say 2023 sorry uh what did it go wrong ah oh, sorry so i am providing the wrong cron expression here so click on the recurring schedule here and once you click on the recurring schedule here you have cron based schedule or rate based schedule so go with the cron based schedule and you know if you don't know how to build this cron information just click on the info button and you will get the cron information right you know how to write this cron expression or you can use this managing clown uh, sorry managing cross uh, cron based schedules and once you put this you can enable this and uh, you know once you click on the next button you are this thing is enabled so the cloud watch and lambda functions event driven approach is enabled and it will start running each and every day but do not do that uh, if you want to uh, keep your cloud cost low because if you forget that then this lambda function keeps executing every day and that would incur a cost i just wanted to explain you how this uh, pattern works so i hope you got a clear picture of how this entire thing works and if you have any questions do let me know in the comment section but do not fail to perform this demo it takes a lot of time for me to build this demos for you and explain so if you do this and if you find this helpful i'll be more than happy that's all i have for today's video if you haven't subscribed the channel please subscribe the channel and share it with your friends and colleagues who are willing to learn aws take care everyone see you in the next video bye bye